Okay, my name is Cash Rangan, and this session is about business at the base of the pyramid. So let me give you a little bit of the background of, of where we are at, and then I'll dive into the, the matter itself. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit. My colleague Michael Chu and I teach this course in the MBA program, and Michael Chu comes from the same world that Chris comes from. He's in the microfinance world. And so let me tell you a little bit of a background of why we do this. First of all, there's a typo which I just recognized that the world has about 6.5 billion people, <laughs> not 42.5 billion people. So it's not growing exponentially that fast. But, but, but the whole idea is most of what we do in any business school, including the Harvard Business School, really pertains to the top 2.5 billion people in the sense that these are the markets in developed economies. It might be Western Europe and North America, and even in the emerging countries, it's the top three or four cities, and it's aimed at the top 2.5 billion consumers of the world. And that's what most of what business focused on because capitalist rules work, free market rules work, uh, and all those things, good things we learn here, work there. What the business at the base of the pyramid is about is the markets that exist for the bottom four billion people. There are four, four billion people who operate in markets that don't look like the markets at the top of the pyramid. So we call it base of the pyramid, rather than calling it purely bottom of the pyramid. And, and why is this important? Why should we in the Harvard Business School care about these four billion people? We should care simply for our own economic reasons. The top of the pyramid was about 80% of the GDP of the world about two decades ago, 80-20. The world GDP is about $35 trillion. 80% came from the top, 20% from, from the bottom. Today, it's about 65-35, because India and China have been growing at 8 to 9% a year. The top of the pyramid is growing at 2 to 3% a year. By 2030, it's going to be 50-50. By 2030, if you aggregate the world GDP, 50% of it will come from those countries and emerging countries which are at the bottom. So it's important for us just economically because these are the markets where we make products, where we sell products. These are the markets that are growing at 8, 9, 10%. Our market is going 2 to 3%. It is important for businesses to participate and understand what's going on here. And these markets don't look like the markets which are at the top of the pyramid. So Michael and I created this course. So now let's get down into a little bit of a refinement of how that market looks like. Now here the numbers are accurate. <laughs> here the numbers are accurate. And you can see that people living at $2,000 a year and above are about the 2.1 billion. And there are a whole range of, of cutoffs when you go to the bottom 4 billion. And this is how it works. So what we like to do is call them Call this the real bottom of the pyramid, the bottom 1.2 billion, who are at less than $1 a day. They live on less than $1 a day. This is what World Bank defines as the poverty line. But there are a whole bunch of people who are not below $1 a day, but this is more like $5 a day. There are about 3 billion people, what we call the submerged market. So the question is, can businesses operate in the middle of the pyramid and the bottom of the pyramid? Can private enterprises? create economic value for investors and social value for the poor. Is it possible? And can you survive as a business and sustain it? That's the question we answer in the course. So I want to share some of our thinking with you. And what, what we have learned is the following. Businesses, many businesses, some businesses can survive very well just focusing on top of the pyramid. But our premise is, by and large, most businesses, just because of economic pressures and the way the world is developing, both through globalization and both through the kind of responsibilities that corporations have taken on, have to focus on the middle and the bottom of the pyramid if they have to survive and grow, number one. Number two, bottom of the pyramid is a very segmented, nuanced, refined market. It's not as though the top of the pyramid is one, bottom of the pyramid is one, let's go. It doesn't work that way. The bottom of the pyramid is very nuanced. I mean, I'm sure many of you, through experience, there is a tendency to say, this is Africa, but Africa is very different. I mean, the South Africa is very different from Nigeria, is very different from Ghana, is very different from Kenya. Similar, oh, BRIC, emerging countries, India, China, Brazil, uh, and then the South Africa, Turkey just keeps going. But people know that Brazil is very different than India. 
and India is very different from China, and China is very different from Turkey. So there are very segmented markets. We have to be very careful in terms of what we learn. <coughs> Number three, I'm going to share with you some examples of firms who have been able to develop business propositions in these markets, earn sustained income, and provide a win-win. Win for their investors and shareholders, and a win for the customers and the poor people. And they've been, they managed to do it for long periods of time. Now, people like me are sort of observing folks who are actually doing it and bring this into you, and there is Chris who's actually done it. So there's a practitioner sitting right there in the microfinance world. Yeah, right here, Chris Crane, sitting here and smiling modestly. So, so people, so they've actually done it. Okay, but, but our other conclusion is, Many businesses and enterprises, both global and regional, are there muddling around, but they don't seem to know how to do it right. So for every one firm that does it right, there are four firms that are muddling around. They don't know how to do it, and many times they do it out of a sense of corporate social responsibility, but they don't know how to scale it, they don't know how to sustain it, and we think that that's not good, because if you do it that way, it's going to be shut down sooner or later. The point is if you do a win-win and if you can show a business bottom line, then you can sustain it, you can scale it, you can grow it, and you can be a real player. If you're just there muddling around, then I don't think it works. So that's the fourth point. So I'll share with you some nuances of each of these. <laughs> so let me first start off with the first point, that the market is complex, it's segmented, and it's not like the base of the pyramid is all one market. These are the poor people. These are the rich people. What can we do? That, it doesn't work that way. That's because, you see, even among the poor people, folks who are at the bottom of the pyramid, they are looking for food, first of all, food security. They are looking for water, sanitation. They are looking for public health. They are probably looking for even political and economic empowerment. Many of them don't even have decision rights in their community or in the countries in which they, they live. They need jobs. These folks need very different kinds of things. But the folks in the middle of the pyramid who operate in submerged market, they have some of the basics. They have basic health care. They don't have tertiary health care, but they have basic health care. There's some education. But what they're looking for is they're looking for skills. They're looking for vocational skills. They're looking for some finance to put those skills to use. They are lo they're looking for nutrition. They're looking for more than just fulfilling hunger. They're looking for nutrition. So they look for different things, but they already have some financial capability to bring in order to engage in a market transaction. And then, of course, when we go to the top of the pyramid, you sort of work in the, in the free market economy. So what we thought we'll do is I'll share some of the nuances that I highlighted for you along these dimensions. What happens at the top? What happens in the middle? what happens at the bottom of the pyramid, because ultimately when we are talking about poor people, it's a very complex thing. Poverty is a very complex thing. It's not any one thing that causes poverty. It's not hunger, it's not homeless, it's a, it's a complicated thing. So let me share with you the first point. The first point is what happens at the base of the pyramid is there's market failure. Markets are not efficient in these, in these environments. There's lack of complete information. <laughs> there is lack of competition. There are entry barriers. These people don't even have economic and political rights. And regardless of what we say, what happens is most of the things that governments do, they do a terrific job for people at the top of the pyramid. When we had all these scandals in the private sector, what happened? We passed the Sarbanes-Oxley law, right? So we get Sarbanes-Oxley, so it's now there's great discipline, and then auditors come in, they take a look, and the CEO and the CFO has to sign off their lives on the financial statement before the auditors can release it. Something happens to, say, Vioxx, or something happens to some drug that causes some unknown side effects, boom, at once. The FDA is on it, there are lawsuits, there's class action lawsuits, boom, we take care of it. But what happens at the bottom of the pyramid is different because these folks don't have political rights, economic rights, and who to speak for. What are the poor rural peasants going to say in China about the fact that they don't have water and sanitation? Who are they going to protest to? And if they protest, you know what happens. I'm just picking China, but it can be any country. It can be Nigeria, it can be India, it can be anywhere. So what happens is there are no free markets that exist here. There are very high transaction costs for these people. These people, if they borrow money, they're borrowing at 100, 200, 300 percent interest rate. There's lack of procedural fairness. There's lack of justice. So it's a very different market. 
And so firms that go to operate in this market should realize that these free market capitalist structures, property rights, all these things we assume do not exist. At the top of the market, we consumers are on an equal footing with firms. People might find it difficult to believe that's true. We are on equal footing with firms. Firms make these products and services. We as consumers go and buy those products and services. If something is shoddy, we don't buy it. And in the long run, firms that don't create value go out of business. It's, that's the free market law. So unless you're creating innovation and value, you cannot survive in the market. Because if you don't, a competitor comes in, they create better value, we as consumers switch over to it, and this firm dies and leaves the market because we are on equal footing. But if you're not on an equal footing, and if the markets are inefficient, poor don't have access to anything else. If they've got to go borrow money, they got to go to the pawnbroker. That's the only option they have. The pawnbroker says, you got to pledge your jewelry, you got to keep this stuff, you do all, and I'll charge you 300% interest rate. Do they have a choice? No choice. No choice. Healthcare. Oh, you get free healthcare. The government provides you free healthcare, but then you got to walk like an hour and a half, wait for another four hours, and if you're lucky, you see a doctor. On paper, public health is free in most of these emerging countries, but in practical, if you, if you really talk about the practicality of it, nobody really gets healthcare. So what I'm saying is these markets are very different, so no matter what we do here, businesses have got to realize that it's not the free market capitalism and the market efficiency that plays out, so they have to be very careful when engaging in those businesses. So I'm going to get down to it. So I'll give you some examples all the way through, but the fundamental point we want to make is if you take care of the needs of the poor people here in terms of health, water, food, security, human rights, education, etc., then what you're really doing is you're creating a market of consumers who are empowered and who can start acting like consumers and drive market efficiency as they go up to the middle of the pyramid. In, in the sense that we are trying to create both a market infrastructure. We are not just marketing to people. We are not just going and saying, what do you want? Can I create a product and service for you? That happens when the market infrastructure exists. When there's no market infrastructure, you have to really create the market infrastructure through the help of these folks. And then when you create a platform that looks like a market, market efficiency starts coming, and these folks advance, and then act like rational consumers in a rational market. It's a very different marketing task. It's not like, let me apply the four forces of Michael Porter's strategy. What does the market want? Can I create a product at a cost? Can I make it? doesn't work that way. You have to go create markets. And in order to create markets, you have to take consumers along with you. And then you hope that this transition happens. So in order to illustrate these examples, I'm going to talk about four things. How do you create a fair market? How do you create access, affordability, and appropriateness? What happens when you try to make profits with poor people? That's a very combustible mixture. One has to handle that because some people might put an ethical background to it, but that's not the case. Unless you make a profit, you cannot scale. You cannot sustain it. And what kind of collaborations do you need in order to create the market infrastructure? And what do you do to empower the poor people and make them act like consumers so that you get the feedback and really you get to know what's on their mind? Okay, so I'm, I picked out five cases from the course, two that address the middle of the pyramid and three that address the bottom of the pyramid. So let me start off with the first case of uh, Unilever. Hindustan Lever is Unilever subsidiary in India. So I picked an example from India, one from China, I picked one from Philippines, I picked one from Kenya. So here is the story of Unilever in India. Unilever sales in India is about $2.5 billion. And, and round about, say, the late 1990s with the world globalizing and markets liberalizing, India opened out its economy. They said, yeah, foreign investment is fine because until then it used to be a closed economy and it was very hard for multinational companies to invest in India, both in terms of hard investments and investments even through the stock market and so on. India opened the economy and when India opened the economy, all the consumer packaged goods looked at 1.3 billion people. They said, wow, there are 1.3 billion people in this country called India. And the top of the pyramid alone is as big as the United States. There are 250 million people who are at the top of the pyramid. They said, wow, our markets are growing at 2%. How much more shampoo and soaps 
and toothpaste and pampers and paper tissues can people buy and toilet paper can people buy in this economy. We sold as much as we can. Now let's go to these 250 million. So Procter & Gamble entered the market. Henkel entered the market. About 10 multinationals entered the market. And just imagine, Procter & Gamble enters the India market. And Unilever has had a monopoly there for a long time because they entered in 1920. They've been there for a long time. PNG comes in, Unilever is there. So PNG has got the same product line as Unilever. In many markets, they seem to think they're superior, superior brands. They say, Unilever, come on, move out of the way. So I'm going to go after your markets and let's price compete. You have a detergent, I have a detergent. You have a toothpaste, I have a toothpaste. You have orange juice, I have a... They start competing on price. And when you compete on price, when you go to a new market like that, where do you go to? To the same top five or six cities, right? You go to Mumbai, you go to Delhi, you go, you go exactly to the place where you have westernized consumers. You compete like crazy. There's price competition. Profits start to slump. So Unilever, which has had like a monopoly in the unbelievable, they had like 40% market share. For in consumer package goods, can you imagine 40% market share? Their 40% market share, why? Because the markets were completely protected. They were the ones who made quality products and they sold to the cities and to the urbanized consumers. They said their 40% PNG comes in, price competition and their profits start slumping. So what do you think the business leaders are saying? Pack up and go home? No, you've been there for 40, 50 years you're coming in, in, multinational competitors coming in. So what do you do? You're saying, look, I am right here. I have been in this country for 50 years. The top 250 million consumers, it's saturated with price competition, but there are another billion consumers down here. And I have access to those markets. Why? Because Unilever has 1 million retailers they sell to. There are like 10 million retailers on the ground. Unilever, the 1 million, they, they go through 7,000 stocks to 1 million retailers. They say, we reach only 250 million people. Let's go to the next 750 million consumers, right? And so they start a program of going to the next 750 million consumers. And they did the calculations, and the calculations showed that if they go to the bottom, this part of the pyramid, the market size, if you sort of include the semi-urban market, is just as big as the top of the pyramid. So they have another $2.5 billion worth of sales they can pull off if they go to the bottom of the pyramid. And they said, let PNG fight it out here. We will go to the bottom of the pyramid, okay? Now, when you go to the bottom of the pyramid, what does Unilever have to do? They have soap, shampoos, toothpaste. They got the same thing. So give me a strategy. What should they do if you're a leader of Unilever there? Come on. Yes, Jane. Lower their price. Lower their price. Beg your pardon, Laura? Reduce pack size. Reduce pack size. And why reduce pack size? Because then you can sell, uh, basically, you lower price per unit, but you can still make some margin on The margin. But I think both Jane and Laura, you're right on. In the sense that, look, you're selling to the poor people. Price per price, ounce per ounce, you cannot sell it at the same price. Because they're poor, because they can't afford it. So it doesn't make sense to sell it at a higher price. But at the same time, they don't have cash flow. This might be like... <laughs> Daily labor in the farm. They go to work for somebody else's farm. They collect their two, three dollars a day. And so they can't buy a large science, fantastic sun silk shampoo that costs five and a half dollars, right? So you have to reduce pack sizes. You reduce pack sizes into what they call sachets, which is like single use size. So single use size. So they don't need to buy a big shampoo bottle. They need to buy a single size pack size and use it two, three times a week. That's the best they can do. Soap, detergent, everything, the pack size has to come down. But you cannot charge them a higher price for two reasons. When you make it into a smaller pack size, it costs more. The packaging costs are more per unit. So there is a tendency to charge more. Now, what happens when you reduce the pack size but charge a higher price? Poor people can't afford it. That's one thing. But if you were to do this in this country, what would happen? Nobody will buy it, but what happens is India has got a very vibrant democracy. There's a very active press. There are these folks called advocates and activists who are hovering around in the corner. They're saying multinational company, Unilever, look what they're doing to our poor people. I mean, they're selling this shampoo at a higher price. 
to these poor because they can calculate. They say one ounce is one cent, so 10 ounces is so much. So they can charge a higher price for reasons of affordability, but also in terms of how you deal with the politics of the situation, how you deal with the government. But you want to make money because it's a business decision. It's not as though Unilever is out there to take care of the poor people of India and China and Brazil. Look, Unilever's investors have invested in it in order to get a return. It's a business proposition. You, Procter & Gamble has come in and the price competition is severe. So they've got to come up with all these innovations, smaller pack sizes. Prices have to be different. How do you reach out to these consumers? Are there any retail shops there in these villages? 2,000 people? No. There are no retail shops. So they've got to innovate on every dimension. Yes, Jerry? Well, I think that they might be able to uh, make use of people who live there uh, if they had sufficient initial capital to buy larger and sizes and, and then sell it. Absolutely. I think, I think, Jerry, you folks deserve a gold medal. I mean, you're hitting everything. And all, all I put up is a picture. I haven't even shown you the video. What they did was they went out to village and they picked this lady out as the local entrepreneur. They said, you're my traveling, you're my Avon lady. Right? They said, you are my Avon lady. And they went after women rather than men because most men had jobs in the farm, etc. Most women did not have jobs. There was a high level of unemployment, plus they did not have the empowerment either. So Unilever said, we will train you to act like the Avon lady, so we'll teach you how to keep your books and balance books, etc. And then they shipped goods in bulk to her, but still in small sizes, because she does not have the capability to divide it all up, right? So they shipped it to her, and they provided her financing, because she can't afford to buy and act like a retailer. So they went and partnered with microfinance organizations in India. So these microfinance units would give her a loan. Unilever would guarantee the loan because she doesn't have any collateral for the loan. They say, we will guarantee the loan. You take this big pack, but the pack will have small sizes of shampoos and toothpaste and soaps and everything else. And they told her, go door to door. You can see the sachet that she's selling. This is, the whole thing is a sachet of shampoo. She's selling door to door to her neighbor and others. She collects cash, she's got 30 days credit, she pays a microfinance loan, and she improves, she doubles her income. <coughs> her, her, her annual income was about $600, now she makes $1,500 a year. She doubles, or nearly little more than doubles the income, and Unilever has put in place something like 25,000 such entrepreneurs in the last three, four years since they started the program. There are 25,000 entrepreneurs, give them like 25, 30 million dollars in sales, and, and the goal is to scale this to 100,000 entrepreneurs in the next five years. Now, how do you convince consumers who, who have not used soap or, or who used tooth powder in the past to actually start using these branded products? Is there television? Is there media in those? Do people read newspapers? <laughs> there we go. So there we go. I mean, you folks are solving the case. There we go. So they have these what they call the communicator, the Vani, the communicator, the, that lady in the red jacket, because she goes in almost like a healthcare provider, not as somebody who sells branded goods. So she goes in, there she's educating a bunch of women, here she's educating a bunch of children on public hygiene, et cetera, et cetera, and they do it in the local schools. They do it in the local schools. And, and here when they do it in the schools, the school principal will say, look, you can't push your brand too much, but Unilever has to push its brand. So they'll talk about Pepsod and toothpaste. But they say, why don't you come in and also teach a science lesson? You become the science teacher because the schools are broke. We can't afford it. So we let you in twice a week, give them a science lesson, and then you can do this stuff. Okay? There are a lot of these things. I mean, you, you can read it in the case. But the question I want to ask you is, what are the two or three things we have learned from this? The bottom of the curve, they want to make money too. Beg a, yeah, they want to. Well, the bottom of the consumer. Yeah. yeah. There are people that have entrepreneurial skills that want to make money at the bottom of the curve. They want to make money at the bottom of the Good. From a business proposition, yes, Warren, go ahead. They redefine the channel. They redefine the channel. You've got to be very clever about it, right? It's the last mile issue in the sense that there are no roads, there are no retailers. It's the last mile problem. They've got to solve the last mile problem. Absolutely. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, Carl. But you created value and social value at the same time. Because now you've got health. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, if they had not created social value, they would not have been given the license to operate in that environment. In the sense that all said and done, this is a public school. The government funds the school. The government funds the teachers. So if you just went into that environment and said, I'm going to push my branded products, then it becomes very hard. You've got to create social value. And you create social value by teaching these kids and those women about public hygiene. So you say, this is the way you use soap. It reduces infection. This is what you do. So you create social value. You have to solve the last mile problem. You have to put money into the hands of these poor Because if you just go into that community, and you sell product A instead of product B, you've not enhanced anything. I mean, you haven't done anything. You've got to create wealth in the community. That's the whole point of business. If you don't create wealth, you've knocked off competitor A for competitor B, and the community will not become. Anything else? Yes, Michael. Yeah. Obviously, they react to the competition. Dr. Gamble, in this yeah. case. Yeah. Um, what's the uh, barrier to Dr. Gamble is doing the same thing in the same way? You got it. You got it. Like, there's no barrier at all. I mean, Unilever can create this model. And Procter & Gamble can follow. They have the resources. They have the know-how. They know how to do this stuff. They'll follow. And here is where leadership comes in. Here is where Unilever has to tell itself, look, I have operated in this market for 50 years. I have access to these stockists. I sort of know what the domain looks like. I will go ahead and take the lead. And they've got to hope that five, 10 years from now, as these consumers advance and start coming to the middle of the pyramid, and acting like branded consumers and have this brand affinity, Unilever will maintain its loyalty, and these people will buy Unilever products. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's no guarantee that Unilever is going to make tons of money. But a couple of ideas have really come out. You've got to create social value. You've got to leave wealth in the community. You've got to come up with the product sizing, et cetera. And you've got to watch out for what competitors might do. Martin? How, how different is this strategy compared to other emerging markets? Because I know they do the same in Brazil. And yeah, in fact, that's what happened. What Unilever did was they perfected the strategy in India. They have taken it to Brazil. And, and in many emerging markets, some of the stuff is transportable. But they couldn't take this to China. They tried to take it to China. It didn't work. It worked in Brazil because of the nature of the market system. There are entrepreneurs in these economies. It'll work in Latin America. It'll work in India. It was not a big success in Africa because that spirit of entrepreneurship and access to finance doesn't exist. People like Chris are there. So they are providing the microfinance access. So you need to also have the access to money. There were enough people willing to provide loans in India. There are enough people willing to provide loans in Brazil. It doesn't happen in China. So you've got to be very adaptive. OK, so let me do this. This is case one. So let me give you at least two or three. This is the uh, Nestle company. Now, Nestle often gets beaten up for its uh, infant food and all the things, all the bad things they've done. Look, we can debate it. We can talk about it. I'm not here to defend Nestle. I'm not here to bury Nestle. I'm just going to talk to you about one aspect of the programming that they do. And this is the milk district. <laughs> what Nestle does is Nestle, as you know, is a 60, oh, 60, $65 billion company. They buy about $3 billion worth of milk every year in order to do all the various products that they do. And what they decided a <laughs> long time ago, 50, 60 years ago, was they will buy the milk from small farmers like this, this person in China. This guy owns about three or four cows. And less than 50 liters a day is his production. And he didn't know where to sell it to. He wasn't getting market rates. So Nestle went in. They create a milk district. When they create a milk district, they go to a farming community. So they tell the farmers, small farmers around, in this case, there are about 13,000 farmers. So they go to the small dairy farmer. They say, we'll buy your 50 liters, 60 liters a day. They buy it. There is a collection point here. And from this collection point, Nestle has got a chilling plant there. They chill the milk. And then within 24 hours, they <coughs> transport it to the milk factory. But the milk factory cannot be like zillion miles away. So the milk factory has got to be within the range because there are many collection points. And they bring it. They make milk. They sell it in the local market. And depending on demand and supply, the excess supply, they make it into milk powder. And they use it. That's, what, that's, that's the Nestle formula, right? Now, take a look at this chart. These are the Nestle's, Nestle's milk districts. Starting 1920s, more or less, up to 1913, the milk districts were developed in the highly developed countries. And then starting 1920s, when Nestle started, Nestle's in 87 countries, all their other markets are in developing country. They're all developed, every one of them. 
So they go there, they put a milk factory, which costs about 10, 15 million dollars, today's dollars. The latest factory, the one in China, was about 15 million dollars. They put the factory there. No guarantee they're going to make a single dime out of that. They put the factory, and then in order to supply the factory, they put collection centers. They need like 10 or 15 collection centers. Each of them is, again, like a million dollar investment. And then they go to this catchment area of 10,000, 13,000 farmers, and now they've got to teach the farmers how to improve productivity. So it's not just saying, get your cow, I'll take your milk. They've got to teach them productivity, which means they've got to teach them techniques, technology on cattle rearing, cattle breeding, and all the stuff that they do, and environment responsible farming. So they really put in assets into the ground. And yes, Connie. Well, that gets back to what Carl was talking about with Unilever. I mean, I like this model a lot better because it creates community wealth. There you go. It creates jobs. It right. brings technology to the community. So you're taking these 13,000 dairy farmers who are sort of selling the milk off and on if they bought it, and they, don't, they didn't know how to do it. You're bringing it together. For so, so that gentleman you saw who had three or four cows at the start of the milk district four years ago now has 13 cows. Right now, Nestle employs 300,000 dairy farmers. 33% of the $3 billion in farmers like that. This is the technology they bring in. And when they do that, that's the point you're making, Dan. When they take that to the community, there is a three to four X multiplier in the community. Because what happens is, in order the, for, for the farmer to transport the milk, you need bicycles. So you create a small bicycle, and there's a shop that comes in for bicycles. Now these trucks that take the milk from the chilling center to the, to the milk factory has got to come back into the town. When it comes back, they get farm produce. So these villages now get access to quality goods, which come back, and you set up retail. So when you, and then, of course, you need the drivers in order to get the trucks back. You create employment. You create jobs. You need managers to manage the chilling plant, right? And so doing all this stuff is three to four times. Plus, they pay taxes on the factory. They pay tax chilling plant. So look what it has done. It has expanded the economy. This, is, this was your point, Carl, right? The Unilever approach is fine. But this approach is better. That's the point people are making. OK. <laughs> so I have focused on two examples, which is at the middle of the pyramid, in the sense that when Unilever went into that community and educated the people and told them about these public hygiene products and created the Avon lady, provided the incentive for the lady, and provided the small pack sizes, et cetera, they were already able to tap into a market. So there was already an inefficient market in existence there. The point is these people were already surviving in an inefficient market. They were buying tooth powder. They were buying very low quality detergent. They were washing their hair with detergent, cloth detergent rather than with soap. So that's what they were doing. But it was a very inefficient market. They used to get supply intermittently. So Unilever went into this very inefficient market. They brought resources. They brought quality products. And when they do that, it improves the life of the people. It creates public health. It creates a little bit of jobs. It puts these 100,000 entrepreneurs in place. All that is fine, but the effect is not as much if you sort of go further down and really create the wealth, the kind of wealth that Nestle has tried to create through Milk District. So these are the two approaches when you're operating in the middle of the pyramid. But what happens when you go to the real bottom of the pyramid, where there are these poor people who don't have cows, who don't have any assets, who don't have any access to product? These are really squatters. And they're saying, just give me basic water and sanitation. You know the Millennium Development Goals. 40% of the develop, developing countries don't have access to water and sanitation. 60% don't have access to sanitation. 40% don't have access to water, right? There are like 1.5 billion people who don't just have clean water, just don't have clean water. And we, of course, have got a lot of water. We get clean water from the tap with fluoride and everything. And now we got this bottled water as well. So we got more and more water. So I think we have, here we have an excess and there they water. Now, do you think you can bring business techniques to address these things like water, basic health? Business techniques work when you're selling soaps, shampoos, creating wealth. People will pay because you pay them for milk, you pay, right. Water is a human right. What do you think? Dan, they can make money? No. Desalinization? Beg your pardon? Desal oh, yeah, technology. Technology can bring a lot of water, right? But Alternative energy to power? That's right, but there are communities 
where water exists, like in Manila, for example, which is what I'm going to talk about. Manila, the, in Philippines, Manila is about 13 million people, 13, 1, 3 million people. East Manila is 5.3, West Manila is 7 point, whatever the balance, 7.7 .7 million people. So here was this water company of the government of Philippines supplying water to these 13 million people, or trying to. They were not supplying water to 13 million people because the poor people, if you're a squatter, if you don't have land rights, etc., you don't even have a house, so you don't get a pipe, you don't get water. So what you have, you got to go walk like a couple of miles or so, get water, or there are these vendors who come and supply water. They come in trucks, so they supply water. And only if you have a proper dwelling, property rights, if you get the stuff, if you have the pipe, you get the water. So this Manila Water Supply Company used to supply water to about half the city, about five to six million people. The other six million people didn't have water. They got it through other, other sources. That's what they got. And the company was broke. The government water company was broke. They had a billion dollar debt. $886 million, $880 million debt. So the government is sitting, and very poorly managed too. Civil servants, government officials managing it. So here comes in the new president, President Ramos. He looks at this water utility, not making money, so doesn't know what to do. Throws it over the wall and says, you guys, private guys, private sector, why don't you businesses pick it up and run it? Because you talk, you know, you do all this stuff, here is Manila Water Company, they are a conglomerate, they are a big conglomerate who are into real estate, they are into hotels, they are into those kinds of property development. Say, why don't you guys run it? So Aime Ayala says, yeah, I'll run it. I'll take it over, I'll run it. So he takes so they break up the concession into Eastern concession and Western concession. So Jaime Ayala takes this 5.3 million people and you'll all be proud to know that Jaime is a graduate of the Howard College and is an MBA from the Howard Business School. So Chris, you're in good company. So, so Jaime says, yeah, I'll take it. So he takes this five point, but he said, as a business, I'm gonna run it as a business, right? He didn't take it as a defensive mechanism to say, look, if I don't take this, what will the government do to my real estate business? What will they do to my property business? What will it, or to the telecom business? He said, no, I'm gonna take it. And he tells the guy, I'll take it. And, and I hope you know that I'm a businessman. That's what I do for a living. And I have investors, I have people who have invested in my company. I need to give them a fair return. So I'll run it like a business. business government says, fine, you run it as a business, but there'll be a pricing authority, and we will, just like our regulatory authority, like our energy, so the regulatory authority will come in, and we will sort of check on your investments and what you're doing, and we'll give you a price increase if, if that's what the investment demand, but we're going to do that stuff. And so Jaime Ayala takes it, and this is what it was. 60% of the residents had access to piped water. <laughs> Two million people, especially the poor people, didn't have access to any water, so they would go out a mile, two miles, collect water from a public tap, or there were these uh, secondhand, I mean, people who would bring water in trucks, who would bring other disposable containers, and that's what they would do, the point that was being made. Why don't you bring it in the wholesale and give it? So they would take the stuff, they would, they would collect that. That's what, the, that's what it was, right? And what Jaime did was, he said, look, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to work with the government to get a law passed that I don't care whether people have tenancy rights or whether they have property rights or not. I want to be able to put a pipe into every home to these two million people, to these poor people. If you want me to do this concession, Philippines government, I need to put a pipe into every consumer. They are temporary dwellers, they are squatting, there's illegal property, but if I see somebody there and they want water, I'll bring a pipe to them. It's not the proper copper pipe, it's the blue polyethylene pipe, PVC pipe, I'll take, government said, is that a condition? Yes, absolutely a condition. I want these two million poor people. Government said, I'm very happy because these are the folks who are going to vote for me in the next election so I can claim I brought water to them, right? Great, take it. So he takes it, he brings a pipe to every community. Now when he brings a pipe to most of these two million people, they start getting water in their home, right? Now, how are you going to collect money from them? So now you're giving away more water to these people, right? So you've expanded your production, and you can't collect money. So how is it a business proposition? 
This looks like charity to me. Yes, Brandy, what would you do? Uh, I think these people were paying for the water before because they had to pay for transportation. There you go, there you go. Not just transportation. I mean, you're absolutely right, Brandy. They had to pay for transportation. So this poor lady, she had to get up in the morning at 5 o'clock to go get fetch water so that she could take care of her husband and kids. So she went an hour, hour and a half to get water, number one. It was not even clear it was clean water. She didn't know where to get it from. And the most important thing is these people were paying five, six times because this water was coming from the same Manila water plant. And what happened to the light? Somebody leaned on the switch there. That's what happened. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so what happened was there are these illicit operators who would break into the government pipe. So basically what would happen is there was this clandestine, the mafia, the water mafia, who would sort of break into these government pipes at night, break into the connection, fill up their truck with water, close off the pipe, and then they would take the truck the next day and sell water to these people. So the production was coming from the same source, except the government was not getting the revenue because they had sort of illicitly tapped into it, number one. Number two, they took this to a collection place, and because they were breaking the law, they couldn't do it in an open place. So the place did not even have any compliance in terms of standards of water, cleanliness, etc. So they took it to some back room somewhere in a remote area, redistributed, put it into plastic bottles, jars, cans, etc., and sold it to these poor people. So all this costs money because they are businessmen too. Mafia is a business. Water mafia is a business too. So they, they're trying to recover their investment. So these poor people were paying a higher price than what Manila Water charged them, right? Now look at this business. Your production hasn't gone up that much, except that your production is now being channeled through proper sources because it is not being illicitly tapped. For the same amount of production, suddenly you're getting revenues on this part of the market where you were not getting a dime. Somebody else was breaking into it. So you get scale, you get revenues, you increase production. Now how do you collect money from these people? How? I assume meters are expensive, so meter at the community rather than at the individual. Got it. I mean, you guys are absolute geniuses. I mean, you didn't need a course, right? That's what they did. Meter is very expensive. You can't put in every home. So what you do is you put a community meter. So you take this whole community. Here is a settlement of 100 huts. So you put a community meter, and you have the community chief, the manager, say, you be in charge of the collection. Right? So we will come every month, and you pay us what the community meter is all about. Now, suddenly, this person now becomes empowered in the community. There are water supplies to these 30, 40, 50 huts. And then collectively, they collect the money. And Manila Water pays this person a collection fee. And the community agent collects it. But they do more than that. They work with this community leader, develop skills, also teach them stuff on hygiene, teach them stuff on sanitation, how to dispose of the sewage. They start doing this stuff. So by doing this stuff, this, this amazing company called Manila Water, the non-revenue water was 63%. That has dropped to 35.5%. Previously, 65% of their water, they could not bill because they didn't know who was getting the water. Now, 65% of the, of, of the water they supply, they know who to bill, they get the money. So just imagine, with the same production, you're, you're starting to bill 30% more consumers. From 60% access, because they put a pipe everywhere from 97 to 2005, they went from 95%, I'm sorry, from 26% to 95% access of water. Non-revenue water has dropped. But to do all this stuff, they had to lay down all these pipes. They had to get all these households in. And to cut a long story short, revenues, this is about $180 million. Their earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation, this is about $100 million. Their net income is about 30% net income is what they make. And the poor people are getting water more conveniently, access at a lower cost than they were paying before, and this company is making a 30% margin. Okay, So now let me go to okay this example. So let me very quickly tell you the story. And a lot of things have changed with this. Here is a hospital in India. The, the, the numbers are as follows. This hospital today sees 2 million outpatients, 2 million. And it does 250,000 surgeries a year, 250,000 surgeries. It's got five hospitals in there. And of this 250,000 surgeries, 
60% of the surgeries are done free of cost for the poor people. So this hospital has got a cross-subsidy model. The other 40% are the wealthy patients who come in and take surgery, and they pay a surplus, and that subsidizes the 60% who can't afford. It's like a huge scale operation. Manila Water Supply Company, I told you, they make a 30% margin. They make 30% because they charge everybody. Here is a company that doesn't charge 60% of the people, and they provide health care, quality health care. What do you think their net income is, percentage? Operating margin, 40% pay, 60% don't pay. So 250,000 surgeries, 60% of that, that's like 150,000 surgeries free, 100,000 surgeries for a 2 million outpatients, 60%. So 1.2 million patients they see free, the others pay. The net profit margin is, how many of you think it is 10%? 20%. How many of you think anything at all? These folks make a 55% operating, or 55%. Uh, <laughs> so Carl is saying, Carl is saying, my God, so they must be fleecing the other people, the rich people. <laughs> no, that's a possibility. That has to be the case. So why do these rich people go to this hospital, pay this huge price? Don did you have an answer? Care. That's the only reason they have to go, because this is healthcare, folks. You know, Indians are great. I am from India, so I can sort of thought. But look, my countrymen are terrific. My mom is terrific. <laughs> She's great. She wanted to have surgery in the Arvind High Hospital, not because she wanted to donate charitably so that she can take care of our countrymen and women. She went there for her, so I told her, Mom, come, let's go to the Mass Eye End here. It's better for me. Now I got to come all the way, sit on a plane, surgery, recovery, come. She said, no. She said, Cash, take your own time. I'm in no hurry. It's cataract surgery. But next, when you're going to India, I want to go to Dr. Visa. Why? Because in her mind, that's, and why is it the best surgery? Because they focus factory. They do 250,000 surgeries a year. Each surgeon does 1,300 cataract operations a year. A surgeon in the U.S. would be lucky to do more than 50 operations a year. A surgeon in India sitting in a private hospital across the street doesn't do more than 150. Sur so why does McDonald's make the best French fries in the world? Because they're flipping a billion French fries a day. So they know how to do it. It's very simple. As simple as that. It's a focused factory. It's a focused factory, right? So the quality is great. And when the quality and when you have the quality and scale, so these people who go there, they pay the market price. They don't pay above average. They pay the market price, but they go in huge volume because of the quality. And because they do 250,000 surgeries, they can bring their cost down. The cost of cataract surgery, the cost of cataract surgery in the Arvind Hospital is $18, $18. The cost of cataract surgery in the US is $1,800. It's $18. That's what it is. Cataract surgery in the US, you add up all these things, it's $1,800. This is $18. They keep it cost really low. And so what they do is, it's an open system, and basically they say, look, we're not going to waste our time trying to find out, you know, give me your IRS returns, and uh, you know, even people. <laughs> you come in, Carl comes in and says, look, I can't afford, I'm a free patient. Fine, you're a free patient, you go through that queue. Right? So they have free hospital, they are paying hospitals. So if you're free, you go to that hospital, you stand in line, you, the, the, the doctors will see you, we will treat you. You'll get. If you can afford to pay, you come through this line. So it's a little bit like the airline. So if, you, if you're a paying patient, you get an air-conditioned room, you get a warm meal. If you're a free patient, you go to that hospital, you get a little mattress and a small pillow, you sleep on the floor, and then there is a cafeteria. There's the hospital cafeteria, you go buy whatever you want. So it's that's the only differentiation. But the doctors who do the surgery are the same. The back room is the same. The front room is different. <laughs> the back room, they all get together. It's the operating room is the same. It's the same surgeon, and they are, they are on rotation. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm operating paying patients. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm operating free patients. All the discipline, they have enforced. And they do quality process checking. For the poor patients, they track through the quality. They say, ah, there were so many defects. You know, we did 100 surgeries in this batch. How come six of these people have this complication? Let's get the surgical team back. The head surgeon will come and retrain. It's the Toyota production system. They sort of check the thing. They, they run it like a Toyota production system. Costs are low, vertical integration. They make their own lens. The interocular lens 
costs about $150. When you do a cataract, you put an intraocular lens. They make their own lens and they make it for five bucks. They make it for five dollars. They make the, so the point I'm trying to make is, since we don't have too much time, this is what you should see. They started, the hospitals in 1976, hardly breaking even, hardly breaking even, and then boom, you can see the revenue just takes off like a rocket. And these are their costs. And the margin is 55%. And they're opening hospitals by the day. They're like, at the time, some of you did the case, they were doing like 100, when I first went to work with them in 1993 or 90, 15 years ago, when I went to work with them, they saw 100,000 outpatients, did like 15,000 surgeries. Now you can see in about 15 years, they're doing 250,000 surgeries. They're now expanding into Nigeria, Sri Lanka, uh, they're into Nepal, uh, and they're into other parts of India as well. They're like in five foreign countries, just exporting the management model. Okay, so look, doing business at the base of the pyramid crucially depends on some things. The last mile, you need access and infrastructure. The milk district, the Shakti model, don't forget the invisible hand of the local infrastructure and what the government brings to it, very important. The product has to be affordable, the pricing has to be affordable, the whole idea of sachet marketing, this is what Shakti, the Unilever program, pricing and procurement. But you need to sustain it, and you have to create value, right? Social value creation, quality is valuable for the poor. But the, more, the other important thing is you need the internal culture. A lot of the companies, where they go wrong is they don't have the internal culture of serving the poor people. If you're always serving the top of the pyramid, the kind of market research, the kind of contact, the kind of innovation you think of is very different when you have contact with the people at the base of the You've got to think in terms of, let's put a community meter. You have to think in terms of, let's change the product packaging. You have to think in terms of, oh, and this only comes when you're connected to the community. That's a problem. The internal culture that holds back a lot of these companies, and I want to underscore that. But also I want to say that you, want, you need scale. When you need scale, you get the profit margin. And when you have scale and the profit margin, it's sustainable. But let's not forget that businesses cannot do it by themselves. Manila Water is very successful because it worked closely with the government. So if you sort of think, I'm private enterprise, all governments are inefficient, go out of the way, you cannot make money at the base of the pyramid because government has all these assets that are lying on the ground. So you've got to work with the regulators and government to get a very, very proactive and very forward-looking arrangement with the government. If you do that, you can bring healthcare, and Arvind Eye Hospital can make 55% margin. You can bring water, and Manila Water can make a 33% margin. You can provide jobs, Nestle makes a good margin, and you can provide products and services, and Unilever makes a good margin. Let me stop there and take questions, answers, comments from anybody. Or oh, Chris, go ahead. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, your work with the Eye Clinic and others have really inspired the microfinance industry to look at um, value added social services that we can distribute down this infrastructure we've built up with microfinance. So in other words, microfinance is a great distribution channel for other than just uh, loans, savings accounts, and, and microinsurance. But rather now we are financing sustainable schools in the developing world. These are budget slum schools where we're making $1,000, $2,000, $5,000 loans. $5,000 builds a classroom in the developing world. These are run by micro entrepreneurs who have a, are providing for their family by running these schools. And the test scores uh, show that they score, the students from these schools score significantly higher than the students that are going to the supposed <coughs> free public schools, which are actually much more expensive for the poor to send their children. We're also making in healthcare, we're making $1,000 loans to nurses who will set up a micro pharmacy and they will then buy an inventory of goods, of pharmaceuticals that will treat the five or six most common ailments in Africa. So patients will come in, that nurse diagnoses them, uh, treats them right there with the pharmaceuticals. And with our microinsurance, so we can be the third party payor, we provide our microinsurance clients uh, increasing their incomes. That gives them the opportunity to pay us an HMO fee, a health insurance fee. We pay it to these micro pharmacies, which then makes them sustainable in the poor receive health care. And all our sustainable operations that are growing, and if we go away, they'll keep going. As you know, the typical model is to throw uh, when freebies are given out, when not just put them out there, and then when the NGO goes away, everything collapses. If we go away, these will continue to work and operate well because they're all sustainable. That's exactly the point. I mean, the previous model was let's bring aid into the community. 
let's provide aid, let's help farmers with these inputs, but if that was given at a <coughs> subsidized price, what happens after the NGO goes away? First of all, it kills local entrepreneurship. I mean, all these models create local entrepreneurship. They're, so when Chris vacates the market, doesn't matter. You create local entrepreneurs. So this brings business skills, but working with the government and the community to bring solutions, lasting solutions. Yes, Carter, go ahead. The, the worst thing we could do is teach the rest of the world to consume like America. Good point. <laughs> and Good point. Uh, it just seems to me that the, the opportunity here is to find ways to build business models that value efficiency, sustainability, and the rest. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we don't need, I mean, water. I mean, I mean, Carter heads up an environmental agency, so he really knows, he really knows what, how, what, what he's talking about as far as the environment. Consumption is a problem. And, and once you get the clean water, fine. We don't need to get the bottled water and the plastic that goes and everything that goes with it. But you need water. You need sanitation. So here is an opportunity to, because we have learned. It's not as though we were completely out there to destroy the environment. That's the way our economy does. But we have the hindsight. We can look at the 2020 hindsight and not repeat the development path that we took. That's absolutely well taken, Carl. Other thoughts, questions? Yes, Carl. Have, have you looked at the bottom of the pyramid of the strategy in the U.S.? I mean, there are a lot of really yeah. terribly poor cool things in the States where people are entrepreneurial. It's not more so. It's just to, yeah. to eat. Have you, have you had any... Companies about how they yeah, Kanye, I think you raised a good question. So just to sort of highlight what happened, this is the way we built the course initially. We've been building it over two or three years. Initially, we went out to those areas, which are all in emerging countries, India, China, Africa, et cetera, to develop. But now I think our next big pitch is, why not we bring Botswana, for example, has got a fantastic AIDS program. Merck has been leading it, Merck and the Gates Foundation. About 110,000 people there need ARV therapy, 90,000 of them get it. 110,000 of them will get it by the end of the year. So fantastic. So the whole idea is why can't we do in Newark what we're doing in Botswana? Why can't we bring to our school systems what Chris is doing in Ghana, right? So. This is like the disruptive technology idea, because when we operate in our environment, some of our mindset, the business mindset, is we bring this big model Cadillac we built for the top of the pyramid, and we're taking it, it's, inexpen it's very expensive, we can't do it. But when we operate in these kinds of environment and we innovate, and we, oh, we can make money, and we can bring this innovation, so now we are learning about how to bring this disruption into, into this economy. By we, I mean businesses are. So Merck is actively looking at these, School systems are looking at this. Microsoft is looking at providing educational software to people, I mean, to the schools in this pyramid. They want to give uh, Microsoft Windows at $3, not $300, right? So st all this innovation is happening, and we will capture them and bring it into our course as well. OK, F folks, we are out of time. This has been a pleasure uh, having a chance to come. Thank you very much.